Go ahead. All right, sounds good. Okay, so. Okay, um, hello, um, and thank you, Professor Radcar, for giving me this opportunity to um, to um, share, my, share some of the research projects in my lab. Um, my name is Wen Longzhang, and uh, I'm a social professor in the Polytechnic School, and I run the uh, Robotics and Intelligence Systems Laboratory. Um, my lab is in uh, the Technology Center, uh, 179. So, um, and uh, today I think I will just give you some, um, it's kind of like some snapshots of the projects that we're doing in the lab. And uh, to, to start with, okay, so the, the, the overall uh, theme uh, for all the projects that we're doing in, in my lab focus on understanding the interplay between human robots and the environment. Okay, so um, essentially the, the, the big research question that we're trying to answer through our project is to enable robots to collaborate with humans in dynamic environments. So if you think about it, there are three kind of uh, key players in this, um, in this uh, sort of uh, uh, triangle, right? The human, the robot, and the, the environment. So uh, we start this, uh, our projects by first focusing on the, the interaction between humans and robots. And we have several projects in this, uh, in this domain, including our variable robotics and some of the human robot interaction projects for collaborative manufacturing. But then we realized that human and robots do not work in a you know isolated environment, right? They basically have they have they have um, you know the outside environment that they, they need to they need to work with. Sometimes they get distracted by the uh, by the by, by the outside environment by by the other signals. Sometimes the environment is very uh, challenging for the robots to work on, like some environments that are really cluttered or, um, you know, with low visibility, you know, things like that. So this becomes, you know, some of the uh, key challenges that we're trying to solve uh, in our project. So um, just to give you uh, some some uh, some some ideas, I think the projects that we're doing in the lab, uh, I generally put them into four categories: one on variable robotics, and some of them on human robot interactions, and I think. If you look at the, 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 the project that we're doing in the first row, our platform, clearly the first one is um, uh, some of the uh, some of the work on exoskeletons and also work on uh, research related to uh, robots that are built off of soft and confined materials. And then for our HRI research, we primarily use um, a mobile a robot manipulator as our platforms. And uh, so on the, on the bottom row, um, we also work on essentially uh, aerial and ground vehicles. So uh, for UEVs, which I'm gonna show you a few videos that we focus both on designing UEVs with some sort of mechanical flexibility. Um, so, so it can actually interact with the environment. That's actually one of the things I was talking about last page. And we also work on um, uh, some research related to ground vehicles. Uh, on the left, uh, you will see we work on some um, algorithm development for autonomous vehicles, autonomous driving. On the right, we also build our own, uh, uh, you know, platform uh, of a robotic bicycle or a robotic motorcycle, depends on depends on our wheels. Okay, so um, I, again, uh, I don't really think I would have the time to basically talk about all the projects. So I think I would just take a few uh, projects in the lab and show you some videos to give you some ideas. Um, for our work in variable robotics, let's first see if this video plays. Um, I want to start with our work on a uh, soft robot. So basically, the first project that we work on is to look into um, these uh, bio inspirations and clearly this is the elephant trunk. And as you can see, the entire elephant trunk has no uh, skeleton. They're all built of muscle, complete uh, soft materials, but they can uh, accomplish very uh, complicated tasks, um, you know, grasping, picking, manipulation, and also um, they're able to wrap around projects and then pick up something that is pretty far out. And so we got we got inspired by that, and we started building um, uh, these type of a uh, uh, soft robot manipulator. And I think we in the lab um, we've uh, developed three different versions. The first version is based on uh, elastomeric material, the silicon. The second version and the third version are both based on uh, fabrics. Okay, I want to make sure that. Uh, we know that the first version that was actually built by my previous colleague, um, and the second, third version was primarily built by my uh, by my student. And um, all these soft robot manipulators are essentially pneumatic driven. Basically, we just uh, pump air into the into these actuators, and as you can see, they can generate different types of shapes, and then it can do different types of tasks, including leading assistance, 
and uh, um, and work, uh, workforce extension. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is just a video of a. It's actually the second version that we built. It's a fabric soft robotic arm. It's a three segment arm. You can see there are three segments here, and they're all built of these small. Um, we call them pneumatic pillows. And when you pop air into it, the pillows will start fighting with each other and generate tension motion. And we leverage that, and as you can see, we build a soft robotic arm that can be really durable. You can think about that in your third arm, right? If you want. And then we, we show because of the compliant uh, uh, material we use, the body can be used uh, for robotic grasping and manipulation. And that sort of resembles some of the functionality that you see in our controls. And we also show some pretty uh, promising. Um, payload capacity that can uh, lift a payload that is 10 times its own uh, body weight. And it's also pretty robust. And because it's all using, uh, using fabric, you can you know, throw them into water and you can, uh, you know, um, be pretty hard to build, okay? And uh, the whole arm only weighs uh, about 1.1 kilograms and it's fully switchable and you can just really put this into a pocket and when you use it, it will just switch out. Okay, um, so this is the first version. Sorry, this is the second version of the fabric arm, and later we also extend that into some uh, some newer work on um, you know new head fabric actuators. And I think uh, it's like four forty one. Okay, so um, this is kind of the extension of our previous work. And the main um, extension we did is the previous actuators can only do this type of bending motion. You can think of it can only do this type of motion. But if you think about elephant trunk or even our human arm, the type of motion, the type of the, the degree of freedom we have is very big. So we started looking at how to build soft actuators that can enable multiple degrees of freedom. And so this is actually our work that uh, we show that by using these uh, knitted fabric, um, we'll be able to generate both bending motion, twisting motion, and extension motion. Okay. And uh, I also have a quick video, I believe, here um, to take 10 more minutes. Second, so I want to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, so basically, these are some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, videos that show the capability. Um, and later we'll sh we'll show. And um, we also build all the onboard electronics. So basically, this uh, soft body can work on its own. We also have this onboard small pump. As you can see, um, this is showing the, the the mechanical design. And this is to show that it's fully compliant because it's using uh, fabrics. And when you pump air into one of the three uh, bending actuators, it will start generating bending motion. And of course, um, you can. Um, of course, you can you can certainly uh, uh, you can certainly uh, pressurize other actuators as well. Which is a fast forward a little bit, and you can certainly also, uh, you know, actually two uh, chambers at the same time, and essentially that will bend at a slightly different direction. So, um, and we also have students who work on dynamic modeling and control uh, of these of these uh, actuators, so that you can actually get pretty precise motion. Uh, that you want. Okay, but this is just to demonstrate the mechanical design, and here we are showing the bidirectional switching. Actually, where we actually have a twisting actuator uh, in the middle, and it will start generating a twisting motion. And later we have a, a I think this was a work in 2020, and I think uh, this year we also improved the design such that we do not really need the two twisting actuators in the middle, but I can still generate twisting motion by control the pressure in these three chambers. Okay, and this is to show you that you can imagine if we stack three segments like that, they will generate a high degree of freedom. Uh, which can be help, helpful for um, uh, grasping and manipulation tasks, right? So it's not only just bending motion. Um, so this is our work on a soft robotic manipulator. And uh, we also uh, have another project related to the soft robotic exosuit. Um, this was a primarily, uh, this project was primarily uh, initiated by my previous colleague. And uh, so the idea is to uh, develop these variable robots that can use uh, Again, these fabric actuators pneumatically driven to support uh, different uh, body joints. And in particular, we start by assisting the knee joint, as you can see over there. And uh, uh, the idea is that, again, when you pump air into these, uh, these um, for example, this inflatable actuator, the actuator will be super fit, right? 
and then we'll provide support to the joint. And in particular, in this design, we were looking at supporting knee extension motion, such as this motion uh, when you walk. Okay. Um, and um, as you can see, because it's using these fabric extruders and then um, uh, really lightweight materials, and the whole exosuit uh, weighs really low. But I need to say that the, uh, the electronics and the pump is actually off, off, uh, off the human body. And we also have some uh, later work that shows how to build these onboard uh, pneumatic uh, systems and the uh, portable pumps. Uh, but and these are some of the testing results, which, which I'm going to skip. But this is just to show you that we started, uh, we collaborated with uh, uh, Barrow Neurological Institute uh, here in the Valley to test these um, actuators on stroke survivors. And then this was a paper that showed our work um, uh, on three stroke survivors, and the results were pretty promising. And I think this is just a video um, showing the device in action, showing the device in action. And uh, basically, this is the fan task uh, for a stroke survivor. And as you can see, uh, this is when the uh, X2 is in there. You probably can barely see any difference, you know, because of the black sleeve. And, and it's actually pretty transparent, but that's what we're trying to say. Right? And when it's active, it will start to pin you a push uh, on your knee center motion. I want you to pay attention to what she said. You know, you know, moments like that are kind of like a highlight uh, for us, you know, when we run uh, like our testing with patients and then by hearing them saying that this really helps us help them uh, do the task uh, more easily. Uh, I think that gives us motivation to keep improving this technology. Okay. So, and I, in fact, as we talk, we're running additional testing of these access suits. So, of course, you're more than welcome to join us. Um, so just fast forward to some of the work in autonomous vehicles. I'm going to probably skip that. But the, the idea is that um, we all know the Vimo. Uh, let me just play this video, but to, to tell you what we're working on, but probably not really telling a lot of details. This is actually a Vimo autonomous vehicle. As you can see, it is trying to merge into the highway. But let's take a look at how it does its job. Okay, You can see it is coming in. And it's trying to merge into the highway, so it's right on the rack. Turn on the blinker. The car behind it already moved in. But it just keeps waiting here, waiting here. Do you know why, why is that? It's because it, is, it has an algorithm built in that it probably won't really merge into the into the highway until somebody really pulls stop. As you can see, the car behind the car in front of us already stopped. It gave the limo a signal that I'm about to hit. But the vehicle is not able to take that signal and just keep waiting and then at the end that vehicle will just have to um, it, it's pretty much push into the next uh, exit and then never more to do that. This is just a snapshot of showing many of the robots that we're developing when we say it can interact with the human in this case interact with the human vehicle or so far uh, from there, right? And then this project uh, we're gonna we're gonna probably skip, but this project is really to develop um, um, an artificial intelligence algorithm. So allow these autonomous vehicles to understand the human intent and also dynamically negotiate with the human driver in these scenarios. Right? How can how can the autonomous vehicle signal its own intent that I'm about to merge in? Right? And this is a really a dynamic process. So we use a lot of uh, ideas from a game theory and reinforcement learning to uh, to kind of do that. And I'm quite sure many of you would also be interested in uh, machine learning and reinforcement learning. This would be a good project for you guys. Okay. Um, I have two more minutes, so I'm going to. Uh, okay, so um, why well, I only have two videos, so I think I should I should be okay. Um, so uh, this is uh, some of the work we're doing um, in the domain of uh, um, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, we work a lot on the um, on the you know modeling and the control of these uh, of these uh, you know uh, quad rotor. Uh, as you can see, they're under actuated. Models are very difficult to uh, accurately identify, and so and and most importantly, as it flies, it encounters a lot of disturbances. How do you reject these disturbances? So I think for those of you who are familiar with control theory and these uh, typical problems that the control engineer is trying to solve. But in particular, this project, we're looking to how mechanical compliance in these uh, 
of you know you know aerial vehicles can allow it to interact with the environment. Okay, so let's just play this video if it does. I think it's on YouTube. So basically, we I just add the torsional spring into the into, into the into the body. So all the four arms can sort of rotate. Basically, you can sort of squeeze that into a smaller size. And here we're just trying to show that because of these mechanical compliance, these vehicles can certainly uh, fly through uh, narrow openings that are smaller than its uh, than its width. Yeah. And uh, and of course there are a lot of control problems inside because when when you fly past it, you can see clearly there's a disturbance going into the drone. Right? How can you draw the draw of the vehicle so that it does not really go too too much off the desired trajectory? And this is to fly through a passageway. Um, and as you can see, as it flies in, it's it it's squeezing it's it, it's its body got squeezed because of the narrow width. And this is just a bottom view of the of the video. You can see as it flies in, it starts going, right? So we have to do a lot of uh, uh, uh control design. Um but this is just to show you that um you know for these type of uh uh I'm an aerial vehicles, it's actually uh, uh these sort of small robots work in the environment. We can do it both through the mechanical design, add compliance, and also from the control side, so that we can best do these mechanical design. Okay. So, uh, the last video that I will show is probably a little bit more onto the onto the controls and autonomy side. So, this is our project of this uh, uh, SRP. So, what we are doing here is to use a UEV to do autonomous object collection. As you can see. Uh, for our partner at SRP, they need to mo regularly monitor the, the, the quality of the water in the canal. They also need to somewhat um, frequently pick up objects from the from the from the canal, either either from, from trash or they have to take water or liquid samples, liquid samples or solid samples. And then, as you can see, it's a very uh, time-consuming and kind of tedious process. So what we're doing here is develop these uh, custom drones that have configuration on it. So what we're doing is to use these vision guided system to navigate the drone and then basically precisely land on the on the on the object and then use our uh, built-in net mechanism to to collect the uh, to collect the object of interest and this may sound a very uh, easy problem but as you can see as your drone gets close to the water there will be a lot of ground wash and it will sort of like uh, push your drone away from where it's supposed to be and uh, so we have to do again a lot of uh, uh, you know precise control and modeling so that you can compensate for these disturbances. We also had a lot of predictive control where you can predict where the, the ground wash is going to push your zone to, and sort of compensate for it. And we designed different types of controllers, and this is a, on the left is what we propose. On the right is a kind of a state of the art. And as you can see on the on the right, you will see the drone kind of really just. Uh, uh, you know, uh, chatter, tra chatter, chatter quite, quite a bit uh, because of the exactly the ground wash. Um, and we also we test different objects, different color, different shapes, and we also test it under different weather conditions. And then this is just to show you that our vision algorithm can successfully detect objects with different sizes, shapes, colors, and uh, uh, brightness. Okay. Uh, I don't know if we have if I have more stuff beyond this point. Let me just try to make sure. And I guess we have one final. This is just to show you that our vision algorithm can always track the object, right? This bounding box is basically our visual tracker. Okay. And then the last one is uh, uh, to do a pretty challenging job because a pretty dark can on a, on, the, on a cloudy day. Okay. As you can see, we also um, we can also successfully uh, pick up these objects. And uh, we believe that. And, you know, technologies like that will probably help the, let's say, our partners at SRP to um, uh, simplify the process. And hopefully, on one day, we can use these autonomous robots to help them do the type of the daily, uh, you know, maintaining and uh, water quality management. Okay, um, I guess that's pretty much what I want to show today. And uh, I'm four minutes over time, but I'm gonna take advantage of that ten minutes that Professor Radikar gave me. So, just want to say thank you again. And uh, I, I do have my uh, email and my live website here. And for those of you who want to uh, take a look at some of the uh, stuff that I've talked about, I would be happy to share uh, any papers or additional videos.
if you are particularly interested in any of the classes. I have a question. What are your office hours? So in case if the students want to stop by. My office hours is Monday, Wednesday, 4 to 5. Okay. Yeah. So meet him, maybe that right. be but, but it would be great if you guys can send me a message to let me know that you're trying to come because uh, for my class, I only have 12 students, so um, we are currently doing my office hour via uh, Zoom. So if you plan to come to my office hour and talk in person, just let me know. Yeah. Can I upload your slides onto the class website? Yeah. The canvas? Okay. All right. Thank you. We will. And just to clarify, uh, you use ROS in your projects, right? Yes, I, we've used ROS in several. By the way, that's my water bottle. That's yours. Okay. <laughs> it sounds like we both like Kirkland. Where's my water? Oh, Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Okay, I hope that was exciting. And now we get back to the boring stuff. Any questions? Uh, anything that you want to ask before we start? Yes. Uh, will we have access to soft robotics for the robotic arm? Soft robotics for the robotic arm? You mean the soft robotics for the robotic arm? No. We are looking at hard <laughs> robotics. Let's let's figure out hard robotics first. And then you can move on to soft robotics. I mean, okay. Uh, multiple rotation concepts again. Yes, of course, I will explain that. And uh, any other questions? So, before I start, I'm going to explain multiple uh, uh, robot arms. Let me see, just making sure that. Uh, so what I need to do is I need to the screen. Okay. And coordinate system if possible. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions related to the material that we discussed in last class? I just want to tell you that there are lots and lots of resources on Canvas. So make sure that you are familiar with those resources. The second thing that I want to tell you, and this is important, uh, is the supplies for the project have been ordered. And I was fortunate to get different varieties of microcontrollers. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. So if you look at the baseline project, uh, the way the tutorial is written, that tutorial is written as if you don't have any experience in building robots, programming robots, or implementing algorithms. If you are at that stage, that means never built a robot, but yes, super enthusiastic, then I would stick. I would stick to basic Arduino because code and everything is done. But you say, "Hey, Arduino is super simple. I don't want to do Arduino." You have an option of uh, ARM Cortex-based ESP32 dual-core processor that you can use inside the Arduino environment, which has built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Again, it's the 240 megahertz processor and tons and tons of RAM. You are welcome to use that processor. The Arduino code that is on the website, once you configure ESP32 correctly, that can flash. So you can run that code, but much, much faster. But do, I mean, you will give, you will be given an option which microcontroller you want to use. Do you want to use ESP32, which is a 32-bit architecture, or you want to use Arduino, which I think is an eight bit of two bit architecture. And then you can actually use either Arduino IDE or you can use ESP32 IDE, which is much, much more powerful. Also, I have ordered some ESP32s that have 
integrated webcam and HD. So if you are looking at uh, some vision-based project where you want to add vision capability, and if you want to see that you want onboard vision, so there's a difference. So basically, the easiest way to do the vision project is you can use the webcam on your computer, or you can just buy a $5 webcam and integrate that with the computer and do the project. But that would be like the computer has to be connected to the system. So your robot has to be connected to the computer. But you want to have untethered operation. That means the robot on its own. Then I would recommend you choose the microcontroller. It's a different PC layout with a webcam, two MB webcam, and SD card, and all that stuff. Okay, it's a ESP32 dual core, 240 megahertz. So it has plenty of power. Now, a step further. If you are enthusiastic, yeah. I was just gonna ask, you know if the ESP32 is standard on all computers or is it just on the computer board? No, uh, ESP32 is a different board, okay. but Arduino community likes that process so much because it's super powerful and it's super cheap. So basically, I could get Arduino PCB board with ESP32. Okay. So which means it has the footprint of an Arduino board, but rather than Atmel microcontroller, it's ESP32. Okay. But it works. And then it has CH2340, so you don't need to get to USB converter, you can just directly program it. And it will actually take 12 volts. So I made sure that there is a power regulator and everything. So you won't have to worry about it. There are some subtle nuances when you try to work with these different processors, uh, but based on what you are want to do, uh, we will have options for you. Servos and everything is ordered. And the most important thing, which I want to emphasize before uh, uh, even starting the class, that you guys ask for a 3D printer. And I went and I Googled and I searched and I contacted and I found a fantastic 3D printer at a bargain price. So you can buy a big footprint 3D printer for $105 and free shipping, no taxes. Uh, the, the link, to be honest with you, I don't get any markup or I don't get any kickback. So whatever you buy, it's whatever you get. So please look at that website. And if you want, order it within two days because they are they have just opened the promotion for us. And if you don't purchase, that promotion is gonna go away. So if you click on the link, you will see that that $189 3D printer is available for 109. So it's $5 it's a coupon, you can get for 104. So if you are interested in buying, I would personally think it would be great 3D printer for personal use. And if you want, a six students can uh, sort of pull in and then get the 3D printer and it should be fine. So, uh, uh, but if you can, you are welcome to use a 3D printer home or if you need a location, uh, we can get you temporary space in the startup lab where you can store the 3D printer and then coordinate amongst yourself on 3D printing the part. So please take a look at that 3D printer, but that promotion uh, will be gone in two days. And once again, on the record, I'm not getting any kickback. So, so it's between you and the company. And then uh, basically uh, the reviews for that 3D printer, I also posted. So you are welcome to check the reviews by yourself. Uh, also, if you look, go to the canvas, the video recordings, 4K video recordings from the last class are uploaded on YouTube. Uh, so make sure that you have access to that link and you're welcome to review what I discussed in the class. This is for uh, online students as well. Okay, with that, I think uh, I can start about today's lesson. So any questions before I begin? So in the last class, I talked about the rotation matrices. 
Now, what I want to tell you is uh, those concepts may sound a little tricky, but at the end of the day, there are only two things you have to remember. So what things you have to remember? As a matter of fact, you don't have to remember all the rotation matrices. First thing that you want to remember is we are going to use a right-hand coordinate system wherein this is going to be my x-axis, this is going to be my y-axis, this is going to be my z-axis. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think this is the max I can, I can do. Okay. So, and then when you curl your fingers in the direction uh, of rotation, if your thumb is pointing towards positive X, positive Y or positive Z, the rotation is positive. And the second thing that I want you to remember is the most important rotation matrix is the rotation about Z. And I will never ask you to derive these rotation matrices. Or as a matter of fact, you don't really have to derive these. Because what's gonna happen is as your robots are gonna go become complicated, very rarely you will use hand calculations that we are doing in this class to solve forward and inverse kinematics problem. Most likely you will use the software like VREP or you can use the MATLAB uh, Simscape or some other robotic simulation software to, to get the forward kinematics and inward kinematics. But many a times you can't trust the software blindly. So you need to have some sort of understanding. And I'm showing here a simple positive rotation, theta z. And this is the only rotation matrix that I want you to remember. And since the rotation is about Z, so what's gonna happen is zero, zero, one, zero, zero. So what's gonna happen is I need to substitute cosine theta Z minus sine theta Z, sine theta Z, cosine theta Z as the rotation matrix. This is the most important rotation matrix that we are going to study uh, in our class. Now, I want to add something to it. Is This is called as the rotation matrix. And the convention of the rotation matrix is you have the zeroth frame given by x0, y0, z0. And you have the first frame, which is given by x1, y1 z1 so this rotation matrix is 0 r1 now please understand this rotation matrix only talks about rotation and there is no position encoding there is no position information so what i'm going to do is i'm going to append position information to this rotation matrix and i'm going to call this a homogeneous transformation. Now, what is this homogeneous transformation? Homogeneous transformation is a four by four matrix. Homogeneous transformation is this four by four matrix, wherein you have rotation matrix here. So this is your R01. So this matrix is three by three matrix. Then I will have bunch of zeros. I will have one and I will have position information here. Now, when you, so think about it, like you're gonna have, I will show you, you're gonna have I, J and K. So you will have I, J and K. So what you need to do is you need to add three things here. So what do I need to add? I need to add, and this is very important. 
here location of uh, frame one with respect to frame zero in zeroth coordinate frame. So probably this is a little mouthful. So what I'm trying to say here is the position information would be the location of frame two uh, with respect to frame one or location of frame one with respect to frame zero in the previous coordinate frame. So as you can see here, my previous coordinate frame is zero. So that's why I want the coordinates in zeroth coordinate frame. And this may sound a little confusing, but it's actually not because we are gonna work out quite a few problems, at least uh, eight to 10 problems, wherein we would step-by-step step discuss uh, how to proceed and how to solve the problem. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a, a simple uh, robot structure. We are going to set up the coordinate frame and then we will try to work out very slowly, step-by-step, step, forward kinematics problem. Being the first problem, I'm gonna go super slow. I will actually show you all the projection matrices and then uh, explain you the problem and then you're welcome to copy it down. So there are some rules for the coordinate frames. So rules. And why do you need rules? Because uh, rules makes our life uh, easy. Later in this class, we are going to use something called as DH parameter convention. In all the robotics books, Danavit Hartenberg parameter representation is used standard. So if you open a robotics book and then they will say forward kinematics, they start with DH convention, DH parameter. That is great. But I personally prefer a fundamental approach where we use the baseline coordinate frame and develop the equation. I tell you the reason. There are many, many cases where the DH parameter uh, implementation does not work. But when you look at the examples in the textbook, they will say, oh, it works for all the examples in the textbook. But it's not true. There are limitations to DH parameters. That's why the, then not only based on DH parameter, uh, people or researchers came up with modified DH parameter. But we don't have to understand or we don't have to use DH, modified DH or its exceptions or its variation. If you stick to the basic uh, rotation matrices and transformation approach that I'm gonna discuss. And that would be my approach of choice because once we are familiar with the rotation matrices, once we are familiar with DH matrices or DH technique, I will show you multiple cases when the DH parameter approach or DH parameter kinematics fails. But unfortunately, the textbook in robotics, very few textbook in robotics talk about the cases when the DH parameter convention fails. So I'm gonna stick to super basic. So I'm gonna give you rules. The first rule is G axis passes through joint. So we will look at the robot. We will draw the kinematic diagram. And when we draw the kinematic diagram, we'll identify the joints. There are only two types of joints, a rotary joint and a prismatic joint. And the very first rule that we have to follow is the Z axis for each and every coordinate frame has to be aligned with the joint. What that means is if you have a rotary joint, 
your G axis needs to be aligned like this. It doesn't matter whether your G axis is pointing away or your G axis is pointing in. So both ways is fine, but your coordinate frame Z axis has to be aligned with the, the rotation uh, of the rotary joint. The second thing that you have to be careful about is if you have a prismatic joint, usually what they do is they add additional rectangle to show the actuation direction. So what this means, this prismatic joint can be extended or retracted in this direction. Here, again, same thing. The Z axis has to be in this direction. It doesn't matter whether Z is going out or Z is coming in, but that is uh, the number one rule. Now, next thing which I want to talk about, it is x-axis of next frame must intersect previous frame. And I would explain this uh, when we actually solve the problem. The third rule is um, basically you have to use the right hand and coordinate coordinate system. And there are, when we look at the DH parameters, you will notice that you are going to have some tables and you are going to have some additional rules uh, about the DH parameters. But once we get to DH parameters solution, I will actually work out the problems. And in certain cases, if you choose your axis properly, it usually helps. So for an example, uh, depending upon, there could be many, many orientations possible. And some orientations will make your life miserable by solving forward kinematics. And some orientations will make your life easier. So what I'm gonna do is, I will take a few examples where deliberately we'll choose sort of a difficult coordinate system. And then I will tell you uh, what happens. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, these are the three main rules. There is one auxiliary rule that I will discuss in next class. But what I want to do is I want to solve uh, a few problems. And I'm trying to find a sort of a nice problem to begin. But yes, of course. When we say frame, mm -hmm. we mean the actual physical frame of, of uh, whatever it is that whatever robot art is that, that we're looking at. Or are we saying frame as a, the matrix that, that we're looking at? So actually, that's a good question. So let me let me answer that question uh, using an example because that would actually make sense. So imagine that I want to solve a, a robot arm that I showed in last class. So I'm going to draw that robot arm. So you have some sort of a motor. On that motor, and I'm going to show it sort of uh, horizontally, you have a link. So this is the motor. This is the link. And on that link, there is motor number two. So what I have is I have second motor over here. And there is link number two. So this is motor one, link one, 
link two, and this is motor two. It's very easy to visualize how this robot arm is going to work. You can actually look at this robot arm from top. You can see this robot arm from top, and if I were to show you the top view, you will say that this is how the robot arm sort of looks like. You have first joint. This is the first motor, M1. This is the second motor, M2. And for reference, I'm going to call this end effector. So this is end effector. Now, first and foremost, we need to identify what type of joints are here. So there is a hinge joint or a rotary joint. There is another rotary joint. And as you can see that this first rotary joint is parallel to second rotary joint. So if I were to classify this robot, this robot will be R parallel R. Now, what we can do is there could be one more motor where the current end effector is. That motor could be parallel to motor one and motor two, or it could be perpendicular to motor one and motor two. So it could, you can add either perpendicular symbol or the parallel symbol and then append that revolute joint. So I have the first revolute joint, I have the second revolute joint. Now, whenever you see a robot like this, you want to draw something called as the kinematic diagram. Kinematic diagram is the bare bone representation of the robot. So I'm gonna show kinematic diagram, something like this. Kinematic diagram may or may not represent the geometry completely. So what I'm trying to say here is, if you think about it, this kinematic diagram may not look exactly like the robot arm, but kind of captures the essence. So this is my first revolute joint. This is my second revolute joint. And I'm gonna show you some distances. So this distance here, I'm gonna call A1. And that distance is from here to here. So this distance is A1. This distance I'm gonna call from here to here, A2. And then I'm gonna say, and this distance, which is from center to center is A2. Then I have one more distance, which is sort of A3, which is from center line of this guy to the center line of this guy, A3. And then the last distance I'm looking at is this distance, which is sort of A4. So I have all these distances. Now, it may so happen that this robot could be folded in, or this robot could be fully extended. Whenever you draw the kinematic diagram, whenever you draw the kinematic diagram, show the fully expanded position. It's not a good question. It has uh, A1. So A1 starts from, actually it can start from anywhere. And I will explain it to you in just a second. So just be with me for a second. So, so A1, is going to start where your first coordinate frame is. So what it means is if I'm going to say, this is my coordinate frame, and I will show you in just a second, this is my coordinate frame. This is going to be my Z naught. So my A1 is going to start where my Z naught is starting. So A1 
has to start at the origin. Yes. You, if all your links are the same, can A1 be equal to A3 and A2? It, they can be, but when we will actually solve the problem, we'll make that substitution to start with. And it may so happen that depending upon the configuration, uh, maybe A1 could be negligibly small, A1 could be zero, or A3 could be negligibly small, A3 could be zero. But when you draw the kinematic diagram, I would extend the kinematic diagram to certain primitive shape. So look at the robot and look at the kinematic diagram. Because what would happen is with this kinematic diagram, uh, the things would become easier when you write the homogeneous transformation matrices. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna extend the, the first coordinate frame. So you have Z and I'm gonna call this X naught. Some of you may ask me why it's not in that direction. It doesn't matter. I just use it's not in the right-hand side direction. Whenever you have uh, Z and X based on the right-hand coordinate frame, you can complete the trial. So for an example, if this is my X, this is my Z, what I want you to do is align your Z and align your X. And you will notice that your Y will go something like this. So you have Y naught. Everyone clear? The next thing is I want you to assign, remember the first rule, the Z axis has to go to the joint. So our first Z naught went to the first revolute joint. Our second Z naught, I mean second Z, which is I'm gonna call maybe uh, sort of Z1. So Z1, Use a different color pen. C1 will go from here. Now, at this point, here comes the most important question. And I want you to pay attention very closely to what uh, I'm going to do. It is super duper critical at this point to choose where X1 should be. It is super duper important to choose where X1 should be. Because once we have Z1, once we have X1, we can find Y1. And I will show you potential options for X1. So X1 has to be perpendicular to Z1. So I could have X1 here. I could have X1 here, or I could have X1 somewhere over here. So there are two possible options for X1. You can't see that? Actually, I'll just draw it and then I'll erase it. So, so you have two potential options for X1. So you see what I'm saying? X1, X1 could be parallel. X1 could be parallel to X0 or X1 could be parallel to Y0. Yeah, but if we, if we use our right-hand rule to determine our Z0 and X0 and they're both parallel, Shouldn't we stick to what Z naught and X naught won't be parallel? No, 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 not no. I'm not talking about the the motor. The motor is parallel. Yes. So shouldn't their axis, since we set Z naught and X naught already on the first motor, um, I, I'm asking, shouldn't we set uh, Z one and X one to to be uh, parallel to that? No. Okay. Now, this is where and and things will be clear once I solve the only problem. But even though I have drawn the kinematic diagram like this, I want you to visualize when the, when the first motor is going to rotate, the whole axis system is going to rotate. Right. So that's why whenever you draw the kinematic diagram, always draw the kinematic diagram in sort of the equilibrium state fully extended. Okay. And then we would use the rotation basically to take care of those successive rotations. So, uh, and and I would I would I would explain that uh, using examples. So, what I want to show you here, real quick, is here we have two choices. But remember the rule number two. X one has to be 
perpendicular to V naught and it has to be intersecting. X1 has to be perpendicular to V naught and it has to be intersecting. Now, what it means is if I if I use this guy, so I'm show you this is um, if I use this guy and I draw x1 here, just imagine I use here x1, you will realize the way I have drawn the kinematic diagram, it appears to me that x1 is not going to intersect with z0. Do you agree with me? x1 is going to go like this and your z0 is going to go like this. So they are not intersected. So this is not a good choice. I mean, uh, sometimes you can, I'll talk about the exceptions later, but I want you to realize that this is not a good choice. Not a good choice. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna use this guy as my X1. And why this guy as X1? Because as soon as I use my X1 like this, imagine my Z0 gets extended, my X1 got extended, they intersect and they are per perpendicular to each other. Do you agree with me? So rule number two is satisfied. Now I have two coordinates. I have X1 and I have Z1. Again, right hand, yeah, question. It can intersect the negative direction as well. So, so if you are asking me, should my Z naught be going upward? No, your Z naught can go downward. But then when you rotate, you need to make sure your rotations are correct. Okay, so now I have X1, I have Z1, so now I got Y. So my Y is in this direction. Y1. Are you with me so far? Now, we have to add something called as the end effector frame. So for end effector frame, that frame is going to be at the end. There is no joint. There is no joint. But if you want to make our life easy, just copy the previous frame as an end effector frame. And I'll tell you the reason why in just a second. So just to make our calculations and math easier, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this frame. I'm going to say this is my Z2. This is my X2. And this is my Y2. This is the most important exercise in forward kinematics. Once your frames are set up, forward kinematics is super simple. I'm gonna wait here for a second and I want you to take a look at it and see the rules that I told you are satisfied. Have you understood this? So first, and I will get if you copy this down. The first uh, rule is your Z axis has to be aligned with the residue or prismatic joint. Second rule is your X1 has to intersect. X1 has to be it has to intersect <coughs> the previous Z axis and it has to be perpendicular. Then if you have uh, the coordinate frame with two axes defined, use the right hand coordinate right hand uh, rule and complete the coordinate system. Everyone understood this yet? Does the new frame have to intersect the Z axis specifically of the old frame, or can it be any axis? No, previous. Oh, uh, but just the Z axis? Huh? Just the Z axis? Or? Just the Z axis. Okay. Yeah. Universal joint. If it, if it joint universal, if it solve universal joint, if it solve spherical risk. But just like what I said to our friend here, before we look at soft robotics, it's very hard robotics. If you think about it, universal joint is combination of resolute joints uh, with zero distance. But that we can solve. 
but we, we will get to universal joints after solving spherical rays. We are not there yet. Yes. Can you show me where the uh, like do we have three frames or do we have three. one? We have three frames. Yes, I saw I have zero frames. So just like the laws of thermodynamics. We have the zero law, we have the first law, we have the second law. Okay. But next question perhaps you may ask me that why don't we have a zero? Why do I start with a one? That yeah, okay, I know. And the reason for that is that is the convention the most of the books are written. Okay, so it's not about convention. Convention. So basically, that is what is if you open a book, you will see the first frame will be zero, but first distance is going to be a one. But once you become comfortable, these are con a convention or just for convenience. So you can change them. But remember the rules. Four rules. Okay. Now what I want to do is actually any question. The fourth rule is right-hand coordinate system. Actually, I combined two rules into one rule, so don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm trying to be efficient. Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> uh, so what I'm going to do is, I want you before you start. Let before we start this very first problem. I want to note is because of uh, our wise choice of coordinate frames, our zero coordinate frame is aligned with the first coordinate frame, is aligned to the second coordinate frame. Once again, I repeat, I want you to look at the zero coordinate frame and observe x naught is aligned with x1, y naught is aligned with y1, and v naught is aligned with v1. Even their directions are the same. That is not by an accident because we deliberately choose it that way. Because then we don't have to take the inter axis position. And I'll get back to you in just a second. I'll get back to that point in just a second. Yeah, question? Uh, can we use another rule of thumb? You, always have to be a you should try to, but sometimes it may not be possible. So I want to start with a simple problem where things are super simple and then we will try to make things complicated. So, so if the motor one moves, uh, does the motor two move uh, in this way or does it move like this? It can go any way it wants. No, I, I'm talking about the axis. Does the axis change or the axis move, moves like this? It's a very good question. So the question is, you are trying to solve a three-dimensional problem. And once the first motor starts rotating, clearly these axes are not going to remain where they are. They are going to move. When the second motor starts rotating, these axes are not going to stay where they are. However, whenever we are going to solve the power kinematic problem, the rotation matrices, if we set them correctly, will take care of that problem. They will rotate the coordinate frames we want. As a rule of thumb, Draw the kinematic diagram in equilibrium position with the robot fully extended, which means don't assume, very important, and even though it may be true, don't assume that this joint is actually something like this. See what I'm saying? So you have the first arm like this and the second arm like this. It may happen, but right now, when you are trying to solve, we have to solve the robot like this. Otherwise, forward kinematics will be very, very complicated. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is, uh, I have I have few minutes. So I will work out this problem. I will try to give you some ideas. And what I will do is, I will rework the same problem on Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> what did I do with my arm? <laughs> yeah. So, for some reason, 
it's not catching my video. You can see. Yeah, it is. It is catching. Uh, oh, it's, I don't see it. Do you see it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Can you hold this? Let me show my arm. So what I said <laughs> is consider the first round, first motor. The robot configuration could be like this, but it will make our life miserable. So when we set up the problem, we have to assume the first arm and the second arm are in one plane. They are not in two different planes. Even though when the motor moves, they could go to different planes, but when we set up the problem, at that time, they should be in one plane. Thank you. Okay. You can see your my selfie camera. I, I see that is very uh, uh, stressful because you can see it, but I don't. So I don't know what I'm saying. No, anyway, or how I look. I by the way. Anyway, so that being said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up my first homogeneous transformation. Oh, another question. You can see the dilemma. Welcome to my world, man. <laughs> I'm seeing I'm seeing dilemmas all the time. Question. A A three yes A three is, and again at this point I just want you to think about it that those distances are the distances between frames. So I'm trying to find out relative positions of these two frames. Relative position of this system. Yes. So is the rotation of first coordinate system independent of the single coordinate system? It's going to be, but not yet. Not yet. It's going to be, but not yet. Technology, am I right? Okay. Uh, it's a, yeah, of course you are right. Students are always right. So that was the question that I answered it. Okay, I'll move on. Okay, so what I'm going to do is so get ready for your first homogeneous transformation matrix. Can you see, I'm gonna say my rotation about the first joint is theta one. Rotation about second joint is theta two. And I have deliberately chosen my theta one and theta twos so that they align with x, uh, x zero and x one. I mean, sorry, V zero and V one. So, if I curl my fingers in the rotation uh, direction of rotation of theta one, some is pointing in the V zero direction. Curling fingers in the direction of theta two, the thumb is pointing in the C one direction. Again, some of you may ask me. I, I get that question all the time. Why theta one? Why not theta zero? That is how it is written. Once you are familiar, you can write your own textbook and change the convention. <laughs> but that may create a problem. And I'm serious because when the first iteration of robotics toolbox was written, it was based on the book by the author, Peter Nock. He used different conventions. Everything was correct. But when I started reading through that book, it took me a long time to understand the slightly different convention than I'm used to. So once you are expert, then you can actually do whatever you want. But right now, please follow uh, the convention that, that we are discussing. So first thing, actually, let me let me let me write show you uh, what do I mean by projection matrix. So you agree with me that my first rotation matrix is rotation of zero frame with respect to first frame. Do you agree with me? Yeah. This rotation is about Z axis. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna make my life easy. And this is going to be my rotation matrix. Remember what should be here? Cosine theta one, minus sine theta one, sine theta one, cosine theta one. This is the only rotation matrix that you have to remember. Now comes the most important part. 
what i want you to do is even even though you may be confident for two initial problems i want you to do this exercise this is x1 this is y1 this is z1 this is x0 y0 z0 x1 y1 z1 everybody understand what they mean right projection of and projection on projection of and projection on now i want you to understand this super important stuff so please pay close attention now what i want to do is rotations are great but i want to see if my zero coordinate frame is aligned with the first coordinate frame it it may be aligned it may not be aligned so here is what i'm going to do i'm going to find projection of x1 coordinate frame x1 on to uh, x0 can someone tell me what is this so this is a projection matrix projection of x1 and i need to start projection of x1 on x0 is 1 0 0 projection of y1 on y0 is 0 1 0 0 projection of projection of 0 so projection of z1 on to z0 is 0 0 1 and your final rotation matrix will be the product of these two so since please note this is an identity matrix so this becomes cosine theta 1 minus sin theta 1 0 sin theta 1 cosine theta 1 0 0 0 0 1 1 i want you to understand if you if your coordinate frames were not aligned the projection matrix is not going to be identity there will be negatives floating around and that will change the sign of the overall rotation matrix i have to stop here and i will see you next week